24 months later, you'll start getting new coupons for diapers. But they are, they are on top of what is the statistical average for a user out there, and when is it they're going to need something, and we're going to be there in front of them. We need to be moving that way in librarianship, particularly in the academic institution. So what I'm, what I'm pointing out here is, as we collect this data, and we collect it on a global basis, and we're looking and seeing that information come together, we want to be in a position where we can turn around and predict that student in order to succeed, to matriculate to an advanced degree, to get a higher score, they need to be using the library resources at this point, and at this point, and at this point. And we want to be in front of them saying, here's what you need, and here's where you can find it. It's proactive services rather than reactive services. It's taking librarianship and turning it from being inwardly focused to outwardly focused. Reaching out and touching the user before they even know they need to be touched. It's the same thing with researchers. We're seeing research data take on a massive new importance in, in our field. I know I just hired a research data specialist at Oklahoma. We're reaching out to the researchers, but why is that so important? Because grant money is increasingly important. In order to obtain that grant money, you want to be able to help the researcher know what helps you win that grant. What resources you might you be using? What steps in the process can the library help you get your data management plan together, help you put together the, the research you need? And again, to be in front of the researcher saying, we know you've applied for this grant. Here's what others who have done that in the past and have won the grant, here's what they've done, here's where we can help you out. Proactive services. We do that because we can collect data on a massive basis and read through it and predict those things. Analytics is going to change the field of librarianship like nothing else I can see. It's a powerful new tool. But it's only when you really have a true cloud computing system that you do this. Because if you're collecting data locally and you're just predicting based on your, bit, on your local users, well, that's fine for them. But if you're competing on a global basis, you want to know what's happening across the continent, what's happening around the globe. Systems that are true cloud computing system bring all that data together, and it's all sitting there on those servers at, <clears throat> as it's happening. And if you have a local system, that's not happening. And so that really leads me to say, here's one important criteria that can help you establish when you're looking at systems, whether you're looking at a true cloud computing system or not. Ask the simple question of the vendor or organization. Can I install a version of this software locally? If they say yes, it's not a true cloud computing system. Doesn't work. You're just collecting data locally. You may upload it to a server, and there there will be some machinations over it. But those that have the ability to do transactional analytics, to analyze that data as it's coming together, as it's occurring in the systems, they're going to be in a far more powerful position. They're going to be far more pro proactive in the services they're providing. Analytics is really important. I've noticed as I've talked with librarians, both in my own organization, back when I was in the vendor world, a lot of them get very nervous about cloud computing. And again, I thought this book had a wonderful quote, that too many of them think, well, I don't like cloud computing. I'm not sure I've got the staff expertise to do this. But this quote is absolutely right. If we want to remain leaders in our own field of expertise and in academic research, we must engage in cloud computing. It does change the skill sets. The people that were running your system in the past now need to take on skills in partner management. How do we handle contracts? service provider contracts, because when you're entering into cloud computing, that's what you're now dealing with. It's a different set of skills, so you need to train your staff in all of this before you dump it on them so that they're prepared to be successful. 
Change management is one of the things that I think we do very poorly in libraries in general. Preparing them for this kind of technology does require an investment in them. And if you make that investment, they are going to be better prepared, they'll be happier, they'll be better supporters of it. They'll look forward to it rather than fighting it. And for us to remain experts, we have to make that investment. So back to the library service platforms. Let me give you some pointers, things to be looking for and thinking about as you evaluate these platforms. The software as a service updates, those at the bottom of this chart. The beauty of these systems is if you're not ready to go through and re-engineer your workflows, and that's a sizable investment. Let's not be uh, diminishing the fact that to do that means you've got to sit down and go through all your workflows and figure out how does this all come together. If you're not ready to do that, these will move you into software as a service, free up some resources, but without having to re-engineer all your workflows. You can, push, you can push it out for a year or two, three years even, um, and you might be okay. I'll tell you why you might not be okay, but <laughs> for the moment, that's one of the values. Of data conversion. Well, you're really not converting much in the way of data. They may be putting data into a new database, so there might be some data conversion, but it's going to be pretty clean. These people own the data. You're staying with the same system. You don't have to go through trying to move it across uh, a new vendor's format. So there, there are definitely some advantages to the software as a service updates. Most of these, new, these products do offer a lot of new functionality, so you do get some major new benefits out of it. Um, so that, you know, there's good reasons to think about that. I think it's important to also realize that when you move into a true cloud computing environment, uh, you'll find that you have data redundancy and system redundancy because most of these systems are offered in configurations that if a data center went down for whatever reason, uh, weather event, uh, whatever, uh, you will be quickly switched over to another data center and service will continue. So there's, there's some nice redundancy in there. If the vendor is really on top of their game and is having their data center certified, there's a lot of assurance for you in the, how the system is being managed, the likelihood that uh, your data is going to be secure. Uh, so again, dealing with a, a cloud computing environment does give you some advantages there. I think it's also important to realize, of course, that as we move to these systems that are supported by telecom networks stretching across continents and even uh, across oceans, the likelihood of a telecom event having an effect on us increases. I mean, that's just a reality, but one we have to be thinking about, particularly as we see weather events continuing to increase. Uh, this is not something we can diminish it, with global warming and the violent storms that are occurring. Uh, there's going to be more downtime. And of course, when it comes to open source software, uh, Kuali is, is the only one up there that's open source at the moment, I'm always pointing out to librarians, be sure to look at the size of the community that's going to support the product when it's done. Right now, uh, Kuali is primarily focused on research libraries. That's not a big community. And so we have to worry about how will that product carry on once it's released? Will it have enough backing? And what does that backing cost? Uh, I think a lot of times we diminish the fact that open source is not free software. I know you've heard this. I'm sure you've heard this. But there's a fee to actually be at the table uh, on open source software that in the case of quality has to be paid. So, you know, just when you're looking at open source, just be sure that you're looking at how big is the community that's going to support it. Um, it's a factor. All right. Let's talk about some of the concerns that I have out there. And I think the first one I really want to highlight is the ownership of the products themselves. I think this is an issue that we tend to gloss over, and I'm not sure that's a good idea. Products, library service platform products that are produced by community owned, in other words, our profession owns the product, have a lot of value because we're always contributing into the vendor good. And I think that's important. When we talk about companies that are owned by private equity, and now we're seeing that three of the major firms 
offering library service platforms are owned by private equity. And I don't think we can be naive about what that represents. Librarianship is about knowledge creation. That's our mission. The mission of private equity is to make money. Those are two very different objectives. So I think when we look at that, we have to understand what happens to the money that we ship those vendors. If we're shipping it to a collaborative that's owned by our profession, the money's staying in our profession. But if we send it to private equity owned firm, that's not what's happening. Most of the time you have to understand when private equity buys a company, they borrow about 60 to 70% of the price tag of the company. And you can bet those loans get paid first out of the income that you send those companies. Then about one and a half to two percent of the money invested by the private equity company gets paid to them as a management fee. On average, the private equity firms take 20 percent of the profits. And that goes off to the private equity firm. What's left out of that money is what goes back to the company to reinvest in products and services. What's important to realize here is how much money is leaving the profession. A lot. Now, I'm not saying that private equity doesn't add a lot of value. There are certainly arguments to be made that those library service platforms wouldn't even exist if they hadn't brought the money to the table to invest in the creation of those products. So they do bring value. But let's not ignore the reality of what's happening in terms of the investments that we're making in these technologies. And these companies get sold over and over and over. And every time they get sold, the debt level tends to increase, sometimes rather markedly. We've seen lots of companies fold under the debt loads they carry from private equity. So we've got to be careful. And certainly, I think when you're dealing with these companies, long-term contracts is not a good idea. Short-term contracts, in case things do start to go south, are a better idea, because then you can switch out. Very important. All right. I think what we often see, and first signs will be, if you're not getting responses to development needs, if your service logs are, are not getting answered, these are places where Cuts tend to get made, and services tend to diminish. We need to be aware that if that's starting to happen, we may have a private equity company that's taking more than the company can afford to pay. All right. I think it's also important to realize that as these products are out there, and the new products get more and more traction, the existing products, their existing product lines will start to get diminished. So if you're on one of the older platforms offered by a vendor that has a new platform, they have a distinct incentive to want to try and get everybody moved as soon as they can. And once they reach a certain point, you'll see the developments on the existing system start to dwindle off. And as I'll explain in a moment, that has real issues. Another place that I really have concerns is APIs. Now, many of you, I'm sure, know what APIs are. For those of you who don't, their application programming interfaces. They are a way for you to integrate your library software into the campus or the community that you work and serve. They're very important. They are, in essence, a standard protocol for getting information in and out of the system. Now, as we look at learning management systems, content management systems, all the various other tools that our students are using, all the apps they're using, they want to be able to access library data. I know we did a survey on our campus. Uh, it said that nearly half of our students want to interact with the library via mobile devices. They're not planning to walk in the library. We're not going to see them come through our doorway. They're going to want to use our resources from wherever they are. I keep pointing out to librarians, this is why you cannot count on teaching our end users how to use systems, because you're never going to see them. You're going to have to make the technology do this for you. APIs are one way that we can do that. They allow us to extend our technology out to wherever those students are. So it's really important stuff, and we need to be able to do this well. However, note that many APIs only give you read-only access to the data. In other words, you can't write anything into the system. You can only pull data out. 
Well, that's good, but it's not everything you need. Um, and of course, there are reasons why the vendors do this, because they want to ensure data integrity and so on and so forth. But you have to be thinking about, is that worth the price you're paying for that capability? We have all kinds of issues once we put our data up in the cloud. What legal limitations are we facing when we do this? Uh, we put our data up there. If we make it available, can anybody use our data? It's our data. It's, it's in their cloud. Will they let us give access to anybody who wants to use it? What if it's another vendor who's a competitor of the firm that's holding your data? Will they let you give them access to that data? Will they let you tell them what the API calls are? There are questions you need to ask there. Are there usage charges for APIs? Do you have to invest in additional training, documentation? Find out, because you want to be able to use APIs. If they enhance your data in that cloud, who owns the enhanced data? Do they own it? It's your data, but now they've enhanced it. These are hard questions to answer. There's no firm answers, but you should have some rights, some ownership here, because you gave them the data that they're enhancing. Can you extract all your data using those APIs, and what are the restrictions around the usage of those APIs? You need to know that. Another issue we have out there is privacy. And of course, this is a topic in all the newspapers these days, data and privacy. But it's an issue we need to pay attention to, particularly as we load data into the cloud. Making sure your vendor has third-party certifications on their data center is a very good step in at least getting some level of assurance that you're doing the right thing and invested with the right vendor. Support is another big issue. If you didn't like support from the vendor who sold you your ILS, and you think it's going to get better when you go to cloud computing, good luck. You better make sure you like the service you're getting. You're going to be more dependent on them when you put your system in the cloud. So make sure, do the studies. Again, Marshall Breeding does some nice reports on vendor service levels. Make sure they're up to the standards you need because you're going to have to supplement it and make sure that it's up to the level your users need and expect from you. I'll tell you that the vendors really can't, because of the nature of cloud computing, they can't write custom support agreements. They tend to write one support agreement, and that's what you get. So read that one carefully and make sure it meets your needs. Because when you're supporting thousands of customers on a system, you can't have a service call and have to call up that specific service contract to see how you respond. It's not scalable. We, we couldn't afford to pay our vendors what that cost. One of the biggest concerns I have about the future here is what I call the approaching divide in the provision of library services. I wrote a very uh, detailed blog piece about this if you want to read it on my blog, but let me give you a little bit of, of the highlights of my concerns here. We have, obviously, we're seeing around the world a society of haves and have-nots. Uh, you, you can't even travel on an airplane anymore without being a have or a have-not, right? Do you have a status card so that you can get on early? You know, I mean, it's everywhere we go. Our world's being divided into silver, gold, and platinum. Well, we have the same thing happening here with library service platforms. I think as we put these systems in place and true cloud computing systems with the power they offer us, to become really strong and powerful, analytic-driven, proactive service organizations, and I, I put that quote up here, we're going to go from being reactive and generic service providers to proactive and highly customized, personalized service organizations. That's a really powerful step. But at the same point in time, as we do that and we see these new systems take hold, and the services they offer take hold. And we see people getting better grades, matriculating to advanced degrees, the researchers getting more grant money. We start to create a divide in, the, in library services. And the older platforms that don't offer that kind of capability are going to fall behind. And once the trend starts opening, 
They're going to fall behind faster and faster. And it's going to accelerate. And we're going to end up with those that have and don't have up-to-date library services. So we've got to be thinking about what that means for us as librarians. All right, I need to wrap up here. So what I covered today, some of the challenges that we're facing as librarians, the things that are driving the creation of library service platforms. We talked a little bit about some of the ways you can assess this technology, things you need to be thinking about as you're moving forward and thinking, is this something for us yet? Should we move to this? Should we wait? Things, considerations to decide what is true cloud computing and what's not. What are analytics and what are they going to give us in terms of the kinds of library services that we can offer? The advantages of the library service platforms and the disadvantages. I like this quote. I like this quote a lot. Larry Page, while I have my issues with Google, as I'm sure many of you do, but that's a great quote.